Hello everyone, welcome to Homemaking Radio. I hope you get a few things done while you listen today. The purpose of this program is to motivate you and give you something to think about while you work. A lot of homemaking is repetitive, maybe even tedious, but it has to be done. And so it's always nice to have a little company. I have my favorite things to listen to, and I know that some of you just want to listen to another homemaker. So today, I hope that you are doing well in your current circumstances and that you have great plans for its improvement. I know here at the manse, I'm always looking around for things that have to be repaired or improved or repainted, and I've got it on my list to do, and so it just seems endless. Of course, it is endless, but we do the best we can because we want to be good stewards of what we are given for the moment, even if we want to maybe move on and uh, do better. And so today I'd like to suggest that you go to the channel on which this is posted and subscribe because apparently you can be notified in some way even if you just go to YouTube and check to see when it comes up next. And you'll know that it's me because there's a teacup on the cover. And speaking of teacups, ladies, we had our 50th anniversary and the, the little church that we serve here surprised us and um, so there were about 16 people that stayed for the for the celebration and the room was decorated beautifully and I don't know how they did it because I live right next to the church building the meeting house and I hang my clothes out on the line I look over there see who's parked there and everything. I don't know how they did it they were so sneaky they must have snuck in a side door or parked out of sight and they decorated it beautifully with golden things and you know I've been to golden wedding anniversaries and I always thought it was wonderful but I never really could quite connect that I would have one someday that we would have one and well, uh, of course they know that I'm trying to uh, cut down on my clutter and everything so they were very careful not to bring a bunch of stuff and they supplied a Costco cake for us with a greeting on it and I had not had one of those in so long that I came home and looked up the Costco recipe for the filling. Everyone's always so fascinated with the filling and I think I found one that I might be able to use. It was cream cheese and whipping cream, vanilla and I believe powdered sugar. I don't know what you call it in other countries but it's the icing sugar and um, there could be substitutes made for people who don't use sugar but uh, that way you don't have to use a lot of them had uh, the recipe included a package of instant pudding I don't use that stuff because I don't like all the ingredients in it but uh, this one recipe that I found I think will do so that was a pleasant surprise and we did get one little piece of that and uh, they boxed it up and took it somewhere and froze it for later I guess but anyway uh, one of the ladies works at a bird seed company she goes there I guess part-time and she fills bags with seed for wild birds so they gave us a, a little set of mugs just two of them got one here and one here and it has three different birds on it and uh, this one has a different set of birds looks like the chickadee so there weren't there weren't saucers to it but that's okay so I wanted you to see that and today I have quite a few things to talk to you about I've been very busy and my house has slid a lot because there was somewhere I needed to go and then someone needed to come here and I had some guests and I had a bit of an upheaval with a uh, a repair job in the house and uh, so I've just gotten far behind on coming here and I've missed seeing you I've missed talking to you and it's the only place I can come where people don't talk back to me <laughs> nobody does anything I tell them to but you might so today I want to uh, suggest that you subscribe on the channel and then go to the link that I've provided underneath the video and that is the blog on which I have embedded the video so as you can see the rest I'll include pictures and maybe describe this a little bit more and so that's what I'm doing them for and you can also leave a comment there you may also 
write to me. My email is on there if you like. And so today I also want to talk about the homemaker's purpose and how it easy it is when you are you have to learn to be self-motivated and self-employed and how easy it is when you are at home to think that no one notices so why should you go to all the trouble to prepare yourself prepare your um, your appearance and get ready and by the way I have a new shirt and it's a green plaid because that just was the mood I was in it's autumn here and uh, what I have done is I have taken a shirt that has the the more traditional collar and I've turned it under and stitched it down so that it has this little round collar and if I wanted to make it a little bit more fancy or feminine I would sew on some uh, narrow uh, ruffled lace around it but I've been doing that turning all these collars under just to give them a different look and um, make them a little bit more fancy for me and so today I also want to talk to you about uh, the motivation and verve that you need for the home that we often don't get from anybody. You know, uh, people will say that when they were at work, working for an employer somewhere else outside the home that maybe they felt more motivated, more uplifted, uh, always, of course, you're, you're given rewards and uh, incentives. So what you have to do at home for your for homemaking and getting ready is to give yourself some incentives and I was very blessed because I had a husband that wanted me to do that and he would say just go to uh, this store and get yourself some special equipment for the kitchen or uh, you know go get yourself some fabric and make yourself a dress or an apron for home or do something that would make you just any kind of luxury self-care uh, anything like that and I have a friend um, that I talk to a lot and she's in the caregiving business she and her husband have a kind of a caregiving service that they give while they live at home but they still take care of people and she tells me that a caregiver which is what a homemaker really is um, has to have self-care and she talks about you know having your favorite things to do and your favorite things to eat and the things that help you feel more uh, dignified and if you were to come here if you needed help and I, I had to give it to you not sure I could but I would think what would you do what would you do if someone came to you and they needed something to help them be uh, motivated and strengthened for the home and have their minds settled and focused what what kind of care would you give them so I thought I can't come to see you then you probably can't come to see me but I can talk to you and give you a little bit of a course right here today to take and the first thing I'd like you to do to settle your mind is to make your list I've got this one I got at the Dollar Tree it says today on it and of course with mine it says today but it was yesterday and the day before and I didn't get it finished uh, is to settle your mind would be the first thing to do would to be make your list because that just gives you a uh, a little capsule of things to do and then you've got to learn to be self-disciplined planned by obeying your list and then I would suggest also to sing I would probably make you sing something make you make up something and sing it put it to a tune and sing it but that seems silly if I were to take you out of uh, the public school or the public workplace and put you in my own course these are two things I would do I would start you out with a list and I would teach you how to make a list the list begins with what is most important in the beginning of your schedule or your day to do we all have to get up and get dressed we all have to you can knock around all day in uh, in your nightwear and do a good job but you still uh, miss out on something by not getting dressed because you're not giving the home the importance that it has to have and so sometimes we need somebody to help us along to settle our minds uh, you know you've often called a friend and you're just getting started but you haven't told her <laughs> I'm not doing very well uh, and somehow as her voice enters your ear you start find yourself working the other day I called somebody to remind them of something and she, she said that the entire time we talked she got some of her garden uh, weeded 
and that was nice. It's nice that we don't feel we're wasting people's time when we talk to them and they can keep moving. I remember the day when we had the cord on the phone and you had to sit there and talk and it was uh, quite awkward sometimes uh, having to excuse yourself and and get off the phone so you could get something done and eventually they inv invented long long cords so you can also move around. Then I would have you uh, do some exercises and you know when I'm talking about exercises this has to almost be a spiritual experience and and so some of these exercises that I recommend really do uh, balance your mind and make you feel better and so I wanted to tell you about one that I have discovered and her name is her name is it, her her program on YouTube is called Weight Loss with Natasha Mohan and I believe she's in India and her her exercise outfits are just beautiful and extremely modest. She does show a picture now and then of of a too fat waistline or something just to motivate you so you know you know what you look like, but uh she her for herself, she wears and keeps covered in just beautiful beautiful uh exercise clothing that's not too revealing and not too tight and it's just pleasant to watch. Uh so if you'll go to her site and I'll try to remember to leave a link you can find her easy exercise and she has one that you have when you're before you even roll out of bed special exercises to motivate you and to get you going in the morning and this is one of the problems i think as being a homemaker is that you are your own boss it, how things turn out are totally up to you unless of course you've got uh, other people that you have to work around that aren't cooperating for the most part if it's to be, it's going to be up to you. And so you determine by your list and by following it and by getting the, the proper motivation how things will turn out. And one of the best things for your mind besides the singing and making a list and the praying is the stretch exercises. And she has a wonderful two beautiful exercises before you even get out of bed, which I really like. And then look for her... Uh, easy exercises that are sitting in a chair. That way you won't um, damage yourself in any way. And I would recommend these for overweight children too. These are not too hard for overweight children. And then you can graduate to something a little faster. They are from one minute to seven minutes. So you're not really in a seriously long workout. I wanted to talk a little bit about this because if you get yourself in a funk and you cannot focus, I would really suggest that some of these, some of these uh, stretching exercises, but don't look at it as exercise. I changed the name of it some time ago in one of my older videos where it wasn't extra exercises. It was mental um, inspiration or something like that. Uh, because when you say exercise, it brings up a different picture to some people. But they're very, you can make them very applicable to where you want your mind to go. And you won't know this until you have tried it and how much it improves your thinking. If you're a negative thinker, these simple stretch exercises can really improve your thinking. I uh, have been doing quite a bit of research about this recently and um, I would also suggest that you read something of that's beautiful. Read something that's not necessary, that doesn't necessarily have to be intellectual. Just read something nice every day. Read a little bit. Um, get some sunshine every day. If you're in a climate where there's a little ray that comes in at a certain time and uh, you see it out there, grab your jacket, run out there, and stand in it. <laughs> and then uh, have afternoon tea. Now, some of you that don't drink tea, just put a few berries in a cup and pour hot water over it, smell it, and sip the liquid. You can also add a sweetener if you like. Another thing uh, that I think that you should do every day if I were to help you to improve your mind, and I'm thinking of myself mostly, what, what works with me? 
is to do something for someone else. And for me, of course, I've got all these descendants and to sit down and write them something is very valuable to them and it helps me a lot. Now, I had something here I was going to show you. I wonder what I did with it. We went on a little holiday. It was uh, three days. And you know how I like these, uh, these index cards. They're blank like this. And uh, what I did is I took a package with me and I took the equipment I needed to punch holes in uh, and make a little book here. And this was called The Beach 2022 because one of the children asked me to keep a record of what we did every day. So I did. And I wrote, uh, I sat down in between trips to the uh, sand and I wrote down uh, the first day, the second day, and the third day. And I may eventually illustrate it but I have a book for them and then I wrote several other little books I not as organized as I want to be so I don't see it around here and uh, so to do something for someone else even if all you do even if all you do is take one of these cards and write a message on it to one of your loved ones and put it somewhere where they can see it or mail it uh, that's better than nothing and you could put a little saying on it one of your own little sayings and uh, practice your uh, your calligraphy or your handwriting or your art just one little thing and I think one of our problems as uh, homemakers and as people in our century is that we feel like we need to do something great and that if we don't do something great something big something complicated that we don't need to do it at all but it's the little things really that count and so when we learn that we will be doing something great and I talked to you last time in the previous video uh, about something Helen Andelin said that was in um, a fascinating girl a fascinating woman who talked about how the homemaker needs to learn to live her daily life and many people cannot do that because the world is pulling and beckoning. You think of all the times in the past, some of you who are vital, how much time we have spent somewhere else gathering things to bring into the home just or having to go out to do errands, uh, pay bills, whatever we do. Um, how much time we have spent away from the home unable to live a normal daily life of uh, washing dishes, cooking, exercising, singing, writing a little story or drawing a little picture. And one of the things that was expected of us back in the 1950s was the homemakers always had really uh, pleasurable, delightful hobbies. It was expected. No one looked down on them because they were sewing or doing some kind of crafting. No one looked down. It was expected. It was part of the territory of uh, being a homemaker and and the the men never looked down on it uh, these days I've heard young men say you know that he didn't like it that his wife had time at home to do something artistic or something that uh, that she liked to do like sewing or whatever and but that was not part of that was not even thought about in the back in the olden days uh, women had their rights uh, had more rights at home to relax when they didn't feel well, to to read a book if they felt like reading a book, to kind of let things go sometimes when they knew they didn't have the stamina. And now they're expected to run like a machine. And there's all these critics around who are criticizing them because they're not, quote, out working, earning a, a wage. And in many ways, we do we do earn a wage because we are protecting the amount of money that's coming in. We're protecting it because we are watching the waste. Uh, we're watching. Uh, we're watching how things are cared for so they don't have to be replaced. We're doing so much now to take care of yourself. I think it's really important to get yourself ready. And I, I think you could start your day with a, a bath or shower. It's like a, a an empty canvas. You get to start over. You get to cover it whatever way you want afterwards. And uh, to to remember to let yourself be happy. And today people are afraid to be happy. We have so much bad news. We're afraid to be happy. We think it's not showing sympathy. I will be reading uh, to you about that today from this book I have.
and to pay attention to the pleasures God has given us, the choice of our clothes, the colors that we wear, the things that inspire us uh, from day to day. For example, as a homemaker, you learn uh, to discern the day, discern the weather, discern the feeling that it has. You can't do that if you're always in a rush. When you get home, you you realize how much you missed by being gone all the time. And uh, so if you could just uh, achieve your daily life, and these are just the daily things that you need to go do, you have done a great thing. For in instance, if you make a list, I have my little list book here, I'll show you. If you make a list, uh, and you have actually checked it all off, that's a, an achievement of daily living. And you might even be writing down uh, your times, you know, 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock, etc. And stopping for a break and to read something or just to do something that's calming and pleasurable. That is something worth writing down and checking off. And it is living your daily life. Now at the end of, I have all these daily things in the beginning. At the end of my little book, what I do is I write down long-term projects that I've been wanting to get at, such as removing old wallpaper, um, rearranging a room, going through uh, boxes of old things, or some some bigger project that is going to take some time. I'll write down those long-term things back here in the back, and eventually I'll find out that I have accomplished some of it if I don't worry about it too much. Now, if you learn also to live without support, you know, I told you, uh, you get praises all the time in the public if you do something and it's with a group or it's with a public group, you get approval. But at home, what if you didn't? Could you learn to live without support? And of course, I'm creating these videos so that you can have some kind of support. Um, homemaker support is what I call it. But what if you didn't have it? You need to learn to work and achieve and plan for your own satisfaction and to also be good stewards of what God's given you and not worry about the support. For example, uh, I hate to bring up a, an unpleasant subject, but when I left the public school system and started to raise my own children in homeschool, the people that I thought liked me and approved me wouldn't speak to me anymore. So I lost all the uh, emotional support of friendship and even relatives, family members, uh, in-laws, that kind of thing. And, and everybody has uh, experienced that when they make a difficult decision uh, to follow something maybe more natural and not with another system. And so you have to learn to do it because it makes your you happy, it makes your family happy, and it accomplishes something that that you think is really important, and not to depend on the approval of other people. Because what if they weren't there? What if you didn't have all that support? And that's how we uh, become convicted about what we're doing, is that it doesn't matter. If you want to do something that's uh, important to you and important to your home, you do it because you have to. You can't go against your conscience. And, and so it's difficult to explain until you've been through something like this. And um, so you learn to do it without support. So the other day, I was uh, thinking about how I have this ladies class that comes every week. And... Uh, has for the church, you know, it's a, it's a church thing, and they come every week for their Bible study every week, and I was thinking about how my lazy mind was thinking about how I could just get by and uh, just have this little area ready they could come and sit in and not worry about the rest of it, and just go to bed, you know, forget about it, and I got to thinking how I would, how much better I would feel if I woke up not feeling pressured and this is one way that you can get rid of this feeling of stress is to get it ready. So I started at one o'clock in the afternoon and got all of these rooms. I thought, well, I'll just I'll just leave the bedrooms alone. I won't change the I won't remake the beds or anything. I'd had some uh, guests and 
there were four bedrooms that needed to be done. I'll just close the doors on those. And I'll just do the, the front room where they're going to be sitting and the dining room that they'll see. I'll just leave everything, leave the kitchen, leave everything. But at 1 o'clock, I got to moving around that easiest room. Always start with your easiest task because it warms you up. It's like exercise. When they do these stretch exercises that you follow, they start with a slow one. They start with an easy one because it warms you up. So I started with the easiest task, just decluttering the living area, making sure they had a place to sit, and um, making sure the tea table was clean, setting all that out, sweeping that floor, and uh, I gained a little bit more stamina for the next room. Well, by 4 o'clock, I had done all those bedrooms, <laughs> and I had swept the floor, loaded the dishwasher, even put things away, done laundry, hung that out, and uh, had more energy and I couldn't uh, I couldn't get to sleep whereas when I was thinking about it in the first place I just wanted to go to bed <laughs> but it's amazing how much energy that it gave me to do all that and so that is to solve that solves a lot of depression is to get things organized and cleaned out now in dressing for the home in dressing for the home my biggest uh, piece of advice that I was ever given was don't appear to be in distress. <laughs> Fix yourself up like you don't appear to be in distress. That you're not uh, put upon and uh, you don't have a huge burden on you and so that people don't feel sorry for you. And always think about David after he went through a period of depression and mourning. He was in apparently sackcloth and ashes, which is another study you could do to be homeschooled, find out why they used sackcloth and ashes. And uh, one day he got up, he washed himself, and he put on clean clothes and, uh, and started uh, facing the day. And this is what we have to do is to think like that to think like David and dress as though we are not in distress. You don't have to go around in sackcloth and ashes looking like the home is the dirtiest job on earth when it really isn't. And create a daily habit and then when you don't have support to lean on, those daily habits will just kick in. They'll they'll kind of take over like a little motor in your mind. And sometimes when I get a little bit uh, discombobulated and I wake up uh, rather bewildered I start out I'll just look at my list I'll start out with that uh, appearance and think about okay the day's gonna be okay just get the appearance taken care of and uh, and the little stretch exercises the prayer the list and then after that see those are the slow easy things you get those things started don't worry about the other things that are bothering you, these other things are a little easier to do. So homemaking is not all confined and unvarying. Uh, as Mrs. Bennett uh, emphasized when she was saying that their social life was more interesting in the country than people thought. If you'll do things in a way that interests you, if you will dress in a way that makes you happy, if you'll do things that in a way that interests you. You have to have a grim job in the kitchen, but do it in a way that will interest you. I put on some music and the old days we used to just do different things, sing. Do you remember? We set the songbook right there behind the faucet, leaning on the window, and uh, started singing while we worked. And you could get through four or five verses of a hymn and just uh, what was it you made long work short or something there was a phrase we used to use and I also have something called punch jobs now these are the jobs of the home that no one notices that don't look like you're doing anything uh, on a table I have a stack of books that need to be put uh, in a certain place so they're over there and then I have a couple packages of seeds because I'm going to plant some herbs and they're sitting over there to remind me of that. And then I have a folded up piece of fabric over there with a pair of scissors there and a pattern. And also something over there that needs to be repaired. It's got a button off of it. The button is sitting there on it. And then I have uh, in the kitchen a jar that's missing a lid. 
And so I've just got, these are just called punch jobs. They are things that nobody would think of as homemaking, but they're those, all those little things that aren't even on your list probably that, uh, that no one notices. A letter that needs to be answered, a card that needs to be sent, and uh, even a list pad to list your grocery, all that stuff. And nobody realizes how much it takes, how much you do, because you do everything. When you go to work for someone else, there's a different employee for each one of these things. But when you're home, you're doing it all. You're managing things and you're also doing them. And uh, then also providing a, a uh, comforting presence in your home for those around you to encourage them. So when you're doing some kind of housekeeping to, this is what I did the other day when I ended up cleaning up everything all at once. Normally my lazy self would say, oh, I can get by with this and I'll just hide a box over here and, you know, throw something over something that nobody will notice. I got it all cleaned up. Was uh, to actually use your mind for something great while you are working. That... I read to you not long ago about how some jobs allow for daydreaming and thinking. Other jobs you have to really concentrate and focus on them. But there are some things that you could be thinking about while you work and that's what keeps your mind great and active. Now back in the 1950s, those of you who are vital will remember that we were hinted at and told at constantly that being uh, a homemaker would uh, addle your mind and you'd waste your life and your and it, it wasn't intelligent stuff to do and your mind would be dull and you wouldn't be interesting and uh, and this was so it was so carefully crafted to make women desire anything but staying home and uh, and it's sad indeed uh, because a lot of women went to pursue other things which did not did not give them very much in return. Um, but one thing you can do at home is to develop your own culture. Have you ever talked to anybody that ended up in a place, many of us that moved around to remote areas, ended up in a place where we didn't feel there was a, a culture uh, sort of in anything and I think of all the uh, places where we have lived where they would take uh, a barren land and make a culture out of it. There'd be a little desert flower that would grow and they'd make a motive out of it and it would become a painting and it would become a printed piece of fabric or it would uh, be part of their their culture. So if you feel where you're living doesn't have a culture, all you have to do is make up your own songs and do your make your own trends um, and create your own customs and habits, even your own styles. Write a story, uh, create, invent, and create your own family culture. And tell your story. Uh, it's very important to tell your story to your children, uh, even if it's just a simple thing and not much to it, to tell your story. If you do, if you've done something or you do something on your on your property or on your home and you have descendants or friends take them around and see what you've planted tell them about your animals tell them about because this is all part of passing on a culture tell them about your parents and your grandparents the good things of course we know many of us just had crazy <laughs> crazy relatives but uh know where you know help people to know that you do have a story and you do have a background so use your housekeeping to improve your mind and uh, this is so important because uh, that way you don't dread jobs you think oh I do want to clean off that front porch I do want to sweep the front porch because now I'm going to rearrange it I'm going to put something on it that's interesting and you're thinking ahead all the time in our ladies class I have started doing uh, just before our, we read our Bible 
section that we're on, I started talking about herbs and spices of the Bible. And this has just been so uh, enriching for all of us. And last week we did nutmeg. And one of the things, you can look this up too, benefits of nutmeg. Just look that up and just enrich yourself on this. They all have a little notebook and they keep track of what I'm telling them, but they can look this stuff up themselves. They don't really need me, but nutmeg, apparently, even if all you do is smell it, if it is, you know, you've got some ground nutmeg and you just smell it, it improves the mood. And many of the sites that I read from said that it, it alleviated depression. And so if all you did was uh, cook it on top of the stove in some water, uh, it would improve your mind and improve the atmosphere. I ordered recently a an oil called pumpkin pie spice. It's just a mixture of of different oils and has a little uh, nutmeg essential oil in it. And um, just a whiff of that, I just put the bottle under my nose and everything. It just lifts me up so much. And we also learned uh, the word canst, C-A-N-S-T. And it shows up in um, the Old English words, thou canst. And it shows up in a lot of the old songs. And so as we were singing one of these songs, uh, I recognized thou canst. And I decided we would look that up. So right away I looked that up. Why did it say thou canst? Because it looks like can't. So we discovered it meant you can. And it's just an old uh, English way of spelling and expression, uh, so it means you can. But we talked about how the younger generation might be very confused about that thou canst. It doesn't mean thou can't. It means you can. So you can when they say thou canst. Or it would use the phrase like thou canst not, meaning you cannot. That might be something you want to look up. C-A-N-S-T. The word can is in it. And uh, just little things like that that give life more depth and more meaning at home. Very important. And so you can become autodidactic and look up these things yourself and start teaching yourself at home. Now one of the problems of homemaking is the temptation not to see the possibilities of it. You think of your if you start thinking of yourself as only a housekeeper or some kind of servant that nobody appreciates, then you leave out the possibilities of homemaking and all that it does. I was talking to a lady that came to see me not too long ago about uh how much uh, we had all learned during the, the time when we were, quote, shut down, uh, what the home could provide. And she had put on a marvelous program in her home for her grandchildren, and it was a pioneer day. And they all came over and did pioneer things. And whereas previously, she'd have to go somewhere else to uh, get the, the room and the space and stuff. She just did it in her own backyard. And she said they had a marvelous time and they didn't know they weren't out, you know, on someone's farm. And she just created this farm atmosphere in her backyard and she had little stations where they would learn to, uh, they'd wash clothes by hand with the washboard and the boys would learn how to make bows and arrows and they had uh, many other things, uh, more primitive things that they could learn, historical things and really uh, enjoyed it. And I guess they, it went on for several days while the grandchildren stayed with her. And so the home has such possibilities, such a potential for hospitality and for ministry too. And some of you young people at home, instead of thinking of going to a, a foreign land, think about being a homemaker and making the home into something that ministers to someone else. I mentioned uh, the lady that had invited me over and she said all she wanted to do was entertain one person and make her home a blessing to them. And it worked. It. I wrote to her. I texted her after I got home that your idea worked. I felt so good when I got home and so inspired. And um, so there's a temptation not to do anything because you think everything has to be done somewhere else. You know, I was looking through uh, that songbook, some of the 
hymn books, noticing how many songs said, I'll go where you want me to go, anywhere with Jesus, uh, go into the field, go, 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 go. And I told Mr. S, I want you to write a song about staying. <laughs> because we are, by the time you're 12 years old, if you've been brought up religiously, you start thinking you need to go somewhere where nobody, uh, where people are ignorant and where they need you and not realize how much you're needed in the home to uplift the family and to reinforce them and to uh, just be there for them and just love them uh, and let them have the, your presence, the blessing of your presence there and how you can minister in the home. Even if you're doing, what you're doing is shining the faucets on the sink, it's a blessing and anything else that you do, uh, making your own clothes or I, I was watching a video of uh, some royalty that was talking about his sister who was also royalty but that she wanted to make her own clothes and uh, thinking how much he admired her for that and not that we want admiration but thinking, thinking what a ministry and what a blessing it is to live our daily life you know that is such a great example too to live your daily life is you're you're sending a, a sermon you're sending a message that you don't realize people are picking up on to live your daily life it shows contentment it shows happiness i went uh, for a walk with my neighbor lady the other day and showed her some little tiny apples that were growing on the hedgerows down this farm road and we were trying to we ate some of them and trying to determine what they were and just discussed it and it was just uh, not discussed, discussed it, but just talked about it. Um, and I was thinking she must not have been too impressed with my intellect. But then I was thinking, you know, we were just doing something that was very simple. Walking, doing our daily life. How many people are needed to coach people just to do that? Just to do some little thing like that. So, for homemaking, put it to the test. And... Go from darkness to light by applying yourself, cleaning it up, making it pleasant for yourself and for other people. Don't be dependent on approval, group approval or anything like that because you might not even have it. I want to talk a little bit about travel because I had been on a, a little holiday with my uh, descendants. And years ago, I had put on my blog maybe 20 years ago I used to find paintings from the 1800s and 1700s of different things depicting something and one of the things I found one time was travelers and traveling clothes and women uh, on, uh, who were traveling or doing outdoor things in the 18, 17, 1800s and their clothes and it was called traveling clothes and uh, so it was one of the things that people used to do was to uh, have traveling clothes. I even found pictures, old pictures and paintings of people boarding ocean liners and they were wearing traveling clothes, which would be different than what you wore at home. Well, that would be something that would be, that would make traveling special is to have traveling clothes. I don't know what they, what it would be, but it'd be something that would be special to you and important to you traveling clothes. So when you travel, you don't give up your dignity. You you have some dignity and even though it's casual, a vacation is casual and we don't want to wear suits or dress up, we can still have traveling clothes. And as I was thinking about that, I went and got Linda Lichter's book, Sim Simple Social Graces, which was also re republished under The Benevolence of Manners. And she had in here if I could just find this. A picture. Strollers on the Coney Island boardwalk on a summer day in 1897 show a sensibility about public dress and decorum that is in stark contrast to the modern era. And she showed this picture of people walking around and look at those beautiful buildings in the background. They, their clothing seemed to reflect that dignity of those beautiful buildings and uh, so I'll try to find that for you and publish it on the page on which I embed this video. 
to show that when you go on a now of course we're not going to wear Victorian clothes when we go down the boardwalk uh, when we visit the seaside which I did but there were some there is a historical society in one of the seacoast towns here in Oregon and every September if I can catch them uh, these men and women promenade up and down this old town it's called an old town. Still has all the old buildings and the boardwalk and everything and the bridge, and uh, you can't cat you can't get them to reveal that they're just dressing up for the historical society. If you talk to them, they'll say, "We're from another era. We're just checking things out to make sure it's stayed. Everything stays where it's supposed to be, you know." And they were just looking at the old buildings and just checking things out, and so they do, and. Uh, I've always thought that one day I'd like to put my Victorian costume uh, on and just walk down the walk down those streets of the old town because the buildings are the, still the same. Why isn't the clothing the same? Well, someone changed the the way people dress in these uh, seacoast towns, and uh, and so we're kind of stuck with uh, this sharp contrast of these beautiful uh, buildings and old towns and and the dull dress, but. Everybody has to find their own way and their own style. Another thing we like to do when we are traveling is to shop. And sometimes you'll get in a place that where the shops are not uh, as good as they used to be. But one of the things that we do is like to buy something that we don't do at home. We don't go out and buy something special. And I uh, went to a little shop on the coast and I bought myself a big a huge bar of soap and it's called pumpkin spice latte and uh, and yes it's very it has nutmeg in it, it smells really good and um, the man that was selling it said that would last me a long time and then we all have uh, we have the current Victoria magazine and one thing that I noticed about this uh, there was a article in here and if you'll you, you can't really see this very well but if you'll notice the furniture is all that avocado green that we that we vitals had uh, shoved down our throats back in the 1960 late 1960s early 1970s and um, but they have taken it they're avocado green leather chairs and they have taken it in this picture and they've accented it with this beautiful deep fuchsia kind of verging on purple uh, accents and colors and flowers and I wished I had known more about this when we were when we had to have all that stuff because I did not know we only uh, were told by decorators you could only match it up with uh, harvest gold and uh, but now they're taking some of these old avocado green uh, antiques and well they call them antiques they're not antique to me but uh, and they're matching them up with other colors and making them look pretty good but this is from a book called The Collected Cottage now and it's by Catherine Crisp Greeley and if you go to uh, there's a site on YouTube called the Tartan Topiary and her name I don't know what her name is but she has she does I'll try to leave a link for you. She does a review of these books and she did the review of Victoria Magazine's Living with Roses and so if you look these books up she reads she doesn't read the book to you but she tells you the highlights of the book and they're all beautiful gardening or decorating books and she's called the Tartan Topiary and I've really been enjoying reading that. It's not all practical for a place like the manse there's usually grand homes that they that she uh, reviews these books because they never they never write books on these little um, what am I trying to call them these little shacks and these rundown places <laughs> places like the vance here uh, nobody ever does a book on them you'll have to do your own book on your own home and uh, then I want to read to you a little bit about Jane Austen here because it's called Greetings uh, and Introductions and it's the use of greetings and gestures in Jane Austen's novels and it's from the site Jane Austen's World and it says something very interesting about introductions 
and that explains when you watch uh, the 1990s series Pride and Prejudice and others how uh, shocked Darcy was when the minister Mr. Collins uh, started talking to him and hadn't had an introduction well in those days someone else had to be with you and introduce you to someone before you started talking to them if you didn't know them and I got to thinking about how awkward that is because today uh, we're pushed into well if you say well, who was that person they'll say oh well just go up and introduce yourself how awkward that is how nice it would have been to have someone who knew that person and knew you take you and formally introduce you but but it is no more and it's so sad because even children feel awkward because they're thrust into maybe a social situation where they're told oh, oh just go up and talk to that person uh, and don't be so shy it would ease things a lot better if it were more like that and uh, and I'm now understanding uh, introductions were so complicated to me because I took classes when I was younger and there was kind of a confusion about who introduced who to who and whether you said their name first or your name first and that was the only thing that confused me but it's still better if you could get someone to introduce you instead of and I see this uh, a lot with people grown-ups that don't have anybody to introduce them and, and you know they feel tense and I feel sorry for them uh, they'll say hi I'm whatever and, and it's nice it's nice but I understand now why there were so many awkward situations in those movies and how well they did that because it was considered not so good uh, to, to not wait until you were introduced I want to read from Helen Andelin's book here uh, Fascinating Womanhood, which I, I realize receives a great deal of hatred. Um, but she has such good character section in here that I just can't find anything better. This is called Refinement. My time is rapidly going. Refinement. One of the marks of a feminine woman is refinement, which implies good social breeding. Now that sounds very um, highfalutin and even conceited. This means to be tactful. That is something we could completely do a whole homeschool subject on was tactful. Courteous, another one. That's a Bible word. Be courteous one to another as the New Testament says. Diplomatic, considerate, sensitive to the feelings of others and the picture of propriety, good taste, and graciousness. See I could have used this when I was uh, maybe 16 years old. Uh, 15 is not too young to learn this. A refined person is careful not to offend anyone. You don't just say everything that comes to your mind. Uh, and it might seem real honest to you and uh, you, you haven't said anything, uh, you haven't said, you haven't done any swearing or bad words or anything like that, but you, everybody needs a course like this, um, although where to get it, I'm not sure. But the wonderful thing about homeschooling you and you homeschooling your children is that the idea is to put the idea in their mind, such as refinement, and then they go and look up more about it. So this means to be tactful, courteous, refinement, diplomatic, considerate, sensitive to the feelings of others, the picture of propriety, good taste, and graciousness. A refined person is careful not to offend anyone, is never rude, impolite, inconsiderate, crude, coarse, or vulgar. Now, she mentions later on uh, not to get into heated arguments, and so when you've got someone around you that you know is sensitive to something, you generally would would be quiet about it. A lot of people object to that because they say we're not being honest, but we also want to have peace long enough to get the other person in a good mood to um, teach them the way more perfectly. And so we don't want to sound like we are attacking and we don't also want to get their uh, back up and get make them tense because they won't be teachable then. I mean, you can tell somebody the truth, but if it won't sink in at all if they're uh, if they've been ruffled if they have uh, had their feathers ruffled as you say um, to be refined never interrupt anyone that's very difficult on uh, these new phones and 
and Skype and um, what's the other one called that we use a lot um, because there's sometimes a, a time that seems like the space and you can talk but the other person's still talking and you don't hear them so that is that is very difficult um, do not Im uh, bring up a subject which 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 would embarrass someone and you know you don't know everything about everyone and so it's really embarrassing uh, even in the ladies Bible study we try to be careful in case we have a visitor that isn't quite on board with something we believe and we keep the conversation somewhat general and and, and it's still in line with the scriptures without making them feel attacked we do eventually want them to be curious enough to search it out for themselves is never rude uh, a refined person is careful not to offend anyone is never rude impolite inconsiderate crude coarse or vulgar to be refined never interrupt anyone bring up a subject which would embarrass anyone monopolize the conversation or focus it on yourself that's very hard to do uh, but each of these things each word in this little paragraph would make an entire study for yourself and it's on page 260 of the little uh, the little pocketbook um, never point a finger of scorn at anyone you'd have to explain what that is never speak your mind to someone in a blunt brutally frank way even though you may be technically in in the right if you can see that you are on a subject which is making someone uneasy have the courtesy to quickly change the subject never use vulgar language profane swear or tell vulgar jokes never pick your nose scratch yourself or blow your nose in public now we were taught in a I don't remember where this was it might have been in our high school home economics class uh, how to lower your head and and dab your nose if you had to and you know not to make it known you know just to be uh, subtle with everything that you did never uh, says such act, act, actions in public are very unrefined don't bring up topics of conversation which are inappropriate or unrefined although these coarse habits are not becoming uh, in a man of course they are more repulsive in a woman that's because they're considered as Peter Marshall said uh, made of finer cloth and uh, that was from his sermon uh, the keeper of the springs I may have read that to you one time and uh, they're the ones the women are the ones that that keep uh civilization civil and uh cultivate refined taste in the way you dress style your hair use good taste in designing the interior of your house the selection of your furniture and dishes cultivate refined taste for art and music never ignore social invitations they should be promptly accepted or declined with graciousness by phone or letter Another mark of refinement, be courteous to everyone you meet, regardless of age, situation, financial, or social standing. Each person is a human being entitled to respect, including children. The higher you respect your respect of human beings generally, the higher your tendency to refinement. Any tendency to arrogance shows a lack of consideration expected of a refined person. Nothing is more quickly calculated to make you appear coarse and unrefined than to ignore or shun another individual. To demonstrate your consideration for people, never do anything to hurt their feelings. Never, for example, show indifference to their opinions or downgrade things they say or do, especially if they consider it important. Be considerate of the feelings, opinions, accomplishments, ideas, traditions, religious customs, or way of life of others. If, for example, you happen to meet a little old lady who has spent a lifetime devoted to traditions, don't show dis re disrespect to her feelings by trampling on those traditions. Or if you have dinner with some honest soul who takes pride in her cooking, don't refuse her food or give any indication that you are less, deli less than delighted in her meal. If you are in the home of an exceptionally refined person, don't show a disregard for her way of life 
by boisterous conduct or heated arguments. On the other hand, if the hostess is fun-loving and set on everyone relaxing and having a good time, show consideration for her thinking by being light-hearted yourself. The greatest mark of refinement you can show is a genuine delight in the company you keep with respect and consideration for their way of living. I will continue this at another time, but I believe that one of the easiest ways to have uh, fellowship with people and refinement is with the tea party because people are just intent on looking at what they're doing and pouring their tea and, and admiring the the food and uh, it just settles people down and makes them feel more refined. Now I will never forget when the uh, unrefinement began back in the early 60s uh, when we were invited to a very refined lady's house and she was having a uh, a celebration for the engagement of a girl who uh, and we were bringing gifts for her and it was just for the ladies but the girl uh, didn't even come dressed up she came in her basketball clothing because she was on a basketball team and came to her own little reception dressed like that and she hadn't even bothered to take a shower or anything and she flopped down on a chair and that poor lady that had this really nice home uh, but she was refined and she she just took it in stride and she was so kind and gentle to her instead and that that's another thing we need, need to learn on the opposite spectrum. When people are unrefined or they're rude, it could be their ignorance. It could be they're not trying to be mean or disrespectful. They just don't know. Um, is to show some kind of a graciousness. That takes a lot of learning, and I've had to become vital before I figured that one out. So, ladies, I hope that you got quite a few things done, and if you will, please... Um, leave a comment that would be nice but if you don't have time I understand completely because this is all about homemaking and making your home a, a better place to be and um, so ladies God bless you and stay close to Christ and I'll talk to you later bye <music>